Thanks so much, Terry. So my name is Felicia Speed and I'm the Vice President of Social Work Services. And I am so grateful to have this opportunity to spend some time with you today to talk about mental health awareness. But what I wanna talk about is more than just mental health awareness with our patients, but also mental health awareness with ourselves. And why, do we, why is this such an important topic? As we have found ourselves moving into this season or period of the pandemic, it has been a huge paradigm shift for our culture, specifically in the dialysis clinic. It has impacted our interaction, interactions with ourselves, as well as our interactions with our patients. It also has impacted our mental and emotional health. We already work in a very demanding environment and adding the layer of COVID-19 has added an additional demand that we were not expecting. But I do have good news. There are ways for us to be able to cope and manage our mental health. So I just wanna take a moment just to talk about mental health and well-being for staff and patients. Of course, I wanna just in, emphasize a disclosure that there are no financial relationships to disclose. So what are my objectives today? They are to recognize the impact of the pandemic on dialysis patients' mental health. And I wanna be able to increase the awareness of the prevalence and symptoms of burnout and compassion fatigue among dialysis caregivers as well as to increase the awareness of symptoms of burnout. Yes, I'm talking about you. And to develop some practical habits of self-care and resiliency. So let's start with first things first, our patients. Yes, they are the most important person that we think about every time we walk into the facility. So having an understanding of their mental wellness is key. When I think about our patients, we first have to begin with, what are some of their triggers? What are some of the things that really set them off? Whether they have mental health issues or not, whether they have symptoms of depression or symptoms of anxiety, whether they have been diagnosed with schizophrenia or personality disorder or any other type of mental illnesses that we may think about. At the end of the day, they're human. And just like we have triggers of things that may set us off at times, our patients are the same. But what I'm finding during this pandemic is that these triggers have been magnified. For example, the chair time. Oh my goodness. If you change a patient's chair time by 10 minutes, it's like a revolt in the facility because it feels like an hour to them. Why is that? Because every single day, they are reminded of the things that they don't have control over. And that, just, that brings us right back down to that bottom level, that bottom topic of loss of autonomy and independent functioning. That change in the chair time is a loss for them. Not only a loss of time because we made a change, but also their loss of control of the time because of that chair time, that chair time change. So the question is not just to know what the trigger is, but how should we respond to it to minimize the trigger? I know you think I'm going to come up with something really deep and profound, but really it's just simply, listen, <laughs> take our time. Don't do drive-bys and just hand out sheets of paper with new chair times. But you need to recognize the individualism of our patients and realize they need personalized care. So I know some of my patients who take their time very seriously, I need to sit down and have those conversations. Oh my goodness. And when we talk about patient provider conflict, there are a range of various things that could impact that. It's a plethora of items that can impact patient provider conflict from the tone, from our stature, from transference to counter transference or simply having boundaries. You know, our patients don't need to know about our baby daddies and how they haven't paid their child support. Well, patients love to get all of the information 
that they can about us. But guess what happens? Just at an opportune time, when they really need that information, they use it to flip on us. So what do we have to do? We have to manage the information that we're communicating with them. The best way to do that is to simply think about it. What would I feel comfortable sharing with someone that I'm standing beside at the grocery store looking at fruit, at fruit, right? Or looking at the vegetables. If I'm willing to tell them that I have some kids and I'm even willing to say, yes, they play basketball, but I'm not gonna give them the details of which high school they're in or what grade they're in or who their teachers are, that those detailed, that detailed information is not something that we need to be sharing with our patients. Establishing those boundaries can minimize conflict. And later on, I'm going to talk about the importance of consistency. But before I move from the slide, one thing I want to remind you is that our patients have families. And those family dynamics change over time as that patient's physical decline may occur. And so because of the burden that comes with, depending on their family and their friends, they can have strained relationships. At the end of the day, when our patients come into our facilities, they're not only coming in with bags filled with blankets and snacks, snacks we don't want them to have, but the blankets and the snacks and all of their board, their games and their books and their headphones, but they're also coming in with invisible bags that we don't see, family frustrations, financial strain. All of these things they come in with, depression, anxiety, they're the bags that we don't see. But it's the invisible bags that impact the wellness that they have for themselves. And it impacts us as their formal caregivers of our own mental wellness as well. And now they come in with a whole nother bag that we were not prepared for, COVID-19. How is COVID-19 truly impacting our patients? Has it increased their ability to be social with those that they love? Do they find themselves being more isolated? Or are they frustrated because they can't go to the social events that they used to? The connections that they needed, they don't have anymore. Not only on the outside of the facility, but even on the inside. Think about it. They used to come in and see our grumpy faces or our smiling faces, but now they've been covered up with masks. So the connections that they used to have with us now seems strained and limited. So what can we do to increase the connection so they still feel that the caring, the caring and compassion that they used to experience, the joking and the laughter that used to make them you know, excited about coming into the facility to see their favorite technician or their favorite nurse? How can we bring those connections back so we can look for opportunities to minimize a lot of these triggers? One of the things I think is gonna be very important for us as formal caregivers are to understand the signs of crisis. I'm starting to see this more and more as we look at how our patients are adapting in the midst of this pandemic. One thing I notice is their inability to cope with daily tasks. Like they used to just run to the grocery store. Now they feel stressed when they go and their anxiety is heightened and they're having to depend on more people. The deterioration in self-care, the anxiety and the depression that they're feeling, you may find that they come in and look more disheveled than they used to, or maybe they just don't comb their hair or they used to wear makeup. So when you see that, you know there's something going on and the rapid mood swings. They came in smiling and happy, maybe, maybe even had a little skip in their step, and now they're just dragging or they're frustrated halfway through treatment and you don't know why, when there's rapid mood swings, that's a sign for us that there's something wrong. And just increased agitation. Yes, I know all of us are agitated every now and then. We're human. But when we see increased agitation for some of our patients that never used to have an issue at all, or they seem to pop off at any moment, anytime we say anything to them or anytime there are any changes, that is a sign. And just a loss of touch of reality. We're seeing a strain on the mental health of our patients. So they're starting to have a lost touch of reality. 
It's one thing if they're just have you know fussing at the at the television, but it's a whole nother thing if they feel like the television is talking to them directly. And just the altered mental status. If they're starting to be more forgetful, or if you find that they have difficulty concentrating more than they used to, that's a sign for us as well. And just unexplained physical symptoms. They're going to physicians, they're getting tests done, but there doesn't seem to be anything wrong. Then it's possible it's more related, not physical, but mental. So when we look at symptoms of depression that is very prevalent in the ESRD population, there are a couple of things that I want you to take in consideration. Patients are not always sad. They don't always walk around with the sad face. Sometimes, believe it or not, they're happy. Every single patient that has symptoms of depression, have symptoms of depression, don't always tell you that they're sad. Guess what? You may ask them how they're doing and they'll put a smile on their face and say, I'm fine. So what does that mean? How are we truly able to understand if they have any signs or symptoms of depression? Well, I'm glad you asked because I gave you a list. If they start to have angry outbursts, that's not the time to pull out and do a behavioral agreement and say, you stop being angry. <laughs> no, we need to not just focus on the what, what are they doing or what are they exhibiting, but the why. Why are they exhibiting so much anger and why are they so irritable? We find that they used to have a lot of interests and a lot of activities. And then when you ask them about their weekend, they say they're just sitting at home doing nothing. That's a sign. Or they come in and they've overslept continuously for treatment. We don't need to always fuss at them because they're late. We need to find out why are they so late? If they used to be someone that came in on time. And like I said, if they have trouble, if they have trouble like concentrating or focusing, or just making simple decisions. Those are signs and symptoms of depression. And we also always wanna keep an eye on for our patients when it comes to thoughts of suicide. We're starting to see an increase in that prevalence amongst dialysis patients because of the increase in isolation. When you're isolated, we have a tendency, all of us, to begin to what we call ruminate over the same thoughts over and over again. So we have to find out what are they ruminating over? What are those thoughts that's on that hamster wheel that keeps going around over and over? Because if it's simply, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone, think about the emotions that are connected to that. Emotions of sadness, guilt, shame, frustration, sometimes anger. And there's behaviors that are connected to that. And sometimes those thoughts lead to suicidal ideation. So that is why we have to step back from the what and ask the why. So our patients not only sometimes experience depression, but they also experience symptoms of anxiety. Even if they don't have severe anxiety, the symptoms of anxiety that we may see may be very pervasive during treatment. They may have a fear of the injection, or just the sight of blood, or just closed rooms. All of us have experienced that at times where you feel like the walls are just closing in on you. Guess when that happens? When you feel like you don't have control. I've experienced that all the time when I'm on a plane. When I feel like, okay, they told me we're going to start a descent, and they said that 45 minutes ago. Now, it felt like 45 minutes ago, but it was really only 15 minutes ago. But at that moment, the plane feels extremely small, where it used to feel nice, and I felt like I had space to move around, and I'm watching my little TV. And now I feel like the person beside me is completely in the seat with me. That's when you feel the walls closing in. So what happens sometimes with our patients, especially when they're wanting to shorten their treatments, it's because they feel the walls closing in and on them and the time just expanding and taking forever. So you may see some intense, of not necessarily fear, but discomfort where all of a sudden they have a lot of back pain, their legs are hurting, or they may have this fear of losing control. They may have you know, heart palpitations. All of these things could be experiences of anxiety. 
So when we think about all the things that our patients are experiencing and all the bags that they're bringing in and how we're to respond to them, before I even talk about ours, let me just say, when you're talking with your patients and they may be experiencing symptoms of depression or symptoms of anxiety, a couple of things I want you to remember. Listen, communicate, and be consistent. I know you thought I was gonna say something really deep, but it's not. You just need to be consistent. Communicate what you're going to do next. Do it with compassion as much as possible. Be genuine, but be consistent. If you didn't let them in early last week, don't let them in early this week. If you don't, if you don't plan to give them snacks every single time, then don't start today. We have to be consistent. That alone will minimize some of their anxiety and depression. And we have to minimize that tendency to make them feel the blame or make them feel guilty. We don't want them to feel shame or because guess what happens? They'll have a tendency as hard as they, they push themselves to get the treatment. I know they were late. I know they have fluid overload and they may even come in with an attitude. But how do you know that behind that attitude and that snarly face isn't a person that's really having a lot of anxiety or having symptoms of depression? So we just have to calm down, hit the pause button, and put yourself in their shoes. So speaking about shoes, I want you now to put yourself in your own shoes, because now we're going to talk about our own mental wellness. What you're going to find very interesting is that their symptoms are not very far from our own. And why is that? Because just because they have symptoms, just because they have ESRD, doesn't mean that all of a sudden now they're no longer human. We're all human and we, it, we manage and we experience stress very similarly. But for you, I really want to talk about burning. Burnout is huge and we're starting to see it more and more because we've been in this intense state that we thought was only gonna last for maybe a month or two or oh, by the summer, things will start to calm down. Well, honey, it's October and now it's January. We've went through the holiday season and things still haven't gotten any better. People are still stressed out. We're still having to wear these masks. We still have all this PPE. We still have to screen people. And things just seem to be revving back up instead of calming back down. And so because of that, when our patients come in, the needs and the demands that they need for us all the way through this holiday season brings us into this point where we're starting to feel a little burnout. You're gonna find that you may have some of those symptoms of depression. You may have some anxiety, not anxiety by sitting on the machine, but the anxiety of anticipating a patient coming to sit down. You may find that you're a little bit more irritable. You may find that you have more issues with your health or just overwhelming exhaustion, just tired and insomnia. It, when you do go to sleep, if you wake up at any point, you wake up and the wheels start to turn and you cannot go back. That's insomnia. And we don't want to talk about it, but an increased use of alcohol. And the way I like to talk about it is we rationalize not only alcohol and drugs, but food. We rationalize, I deserve this. It's been a stressful day. I need more than I usually would use. And those are the things that we do when we have signs of burning. So I'm great, very grateful for Mazda because they develop a burnout inventory. And when you get a chance, you're welcome to go online and they actually can, you can take a survey to determine how burnout you really are, but it's gonna be based on three sub scales. The first one, emotional exhaustion. And my favorite story about that is that I love the Cosby show. And my favorite character is Claire. Claire, one moment, she was, she was having that cow gun moment that I call it. You know, I, I'm, I'm telling on myself, but the cow gun moment is that lady that would have all these little bubbles around her head. And she just had the children crying. The dishes need to be washed. She needs to clean her house. She's got to take somebody to soccer practice. And it was whirling around her head. Well, Claire on the Cosby show had that same experience. And I saw her sitting on her bed and she told her husband, I have nothing else to give. Well, guess what? 
we all have those moments of just emotional exhaustion where we are in empathy overload. We have given all that we can give. And so guess what happens? We have a tendency just to have more fatigue. You wake up and you slept all night and you're still tired. Not only do you have emotional exhaustion, but then you have depersonalization. Depersonalization is when you find yourself being a little cynical where the empathy has gone out the door. Compassion went down the street for a snack. So the thing is, is that you depersonalize because you stop seeing people for individuals, you stop putting yourself in their shoes, and you start being a little sarcastic, and you say things like, well, if you don't care about coming, fine with me. That's depersonalization. That's a sign of burnout. And lastly, personal accomplishment. It's when you just feel like all the things you've done is still not enough, where you really don't have good job satisfaction. And we're seeing that a lot during this time because we're doing so much. We work on the patient's labs, we educate, and we don't see improvement. We're doing all these things, working with all these agencies, working with all these resources, and we don't see improvement. And that is where we start to see the decline in personal accomplishment. So I encourage you, check out that Maslock Burnout Inventory. And while you're doing that, think about some of these symptoms and think about some prevention. Now, when I talk about the physical symptoms of burnout, it could be things that can happen to any of us where we may have some shortness of breath, we may have headaches, we may have a lot of fatigue. Does that sound familiar to you? That sounds like some symptoms of COVID-19. Guess what? Many people are thinking that they have COVID-19 when actually, they're experiencing burning. And emotional, we talked about the emotional exhaustion, where you're irritable, where you're angry, where you have depression or anxiety. But let's talk about some prevention. Self-care, yes. You say, oh, I don't have time for that. Well, you have to make time. You are important. You have to make yourself important so that your patients can, so that you have enough in you to make sure your patients feel that they're important. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to ask ourselves a few questions. What is it that I need right now? Who do I need to talk to about my situation? And you've got to increase your personal reserves. You can't give out everything that you don't keep anything for yourself. I always tell people, fill your own cup first and nourish others with the overflow. You've got to think about yourself because you can't think about others more than you think about yourself. You are important, you are vital, and you deserve time. You deserve time to take care of yourself. And how are we gonna do that? Well, I'm not gonna go through this whole list with you. You can read, but I will point out some that I found to be beneficial for myself. First, unplug for an hour a day. And when I say unplug, I mean unplug. That means simply unplug from social media, Facebook, Twitter, unplug from TV, unplug from reading all these newspapers, unplug from your phone that you feel has to be connected to your hip. You need to take a moment and unplug. Now, I know you say, listen, I only have so many hours in a day and I already feel like I need more. I can't give an hour. But can you give me 30 minutes? Can you give me 15 minutes? You'll be amazed at what 15 minutes or 30 minutes of just simply unplugging can do for you. It gives you an opportunity to recharge, to rejuvenate, to restore. Think about it. Sometimes you have to just put your phone down and plug it in because it needs to be recharged. What about you? If your phone needs it, why don't you think you need it? You have to take those moments to unplug and have a good laugh. Now, guess what? Your body does not know if something is funny. I know it sounds crazy, but your body doesn't know. So you can just start laughing and, and the, your body will release all of the endorphins that you need that's going to give healing and restoration and energy and will decrease your stress. So even right now, wherever you are, just bust out laughing. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> that
that is having a good laugh. It's not hard to do. And guess what, honey? I got so much going on in my life. There is always something to laugh about. <laughs> but good laughter is good for your soul and it's good for your body. And the last one I want to really emphasize, I know you think I talk about exercise, but I can't talk to you about something. I'm still working on myself. I'm just trying to get through the holidays and think about trying to start going, trying to join Weight Watchers, but not today. So grateful journal, the beginning of the year, have you thought about starting something where you can be grateful? Think about, even if you just put it in your phone, start in your notes, 10, five, let's start with five things. Five things that you are grateful for every single day. In the morning when you wake up, what are you grateful for? When you go to bed at night, what are the five things you're grateful for? Were you grateful to be able to feel the sun on your face? Were you grateful to feel the snow in your fingers? Were you grateful that you had a heartbeat? Were you grateful that you were able to spend time with your family? It can be so simple of what you're grateful for, but the more you think about what you're grateful for, you will stop emphasizing and consuming yourself with all the things that to complain about. Yes, we have a lot to complain about, but think about how much you're grateful for. It can shift you on the inside, it can shift your mind, it can shift your emotions and put you in a place of gratitude that you can begin to take back your joy and enjoy your day even more. So I love giving out tips and I hope that you can choose one of these to start your day this week. One I wanna focus on, I talked about giving thanks. Dropping grudges, yes, we do need to do that, but I really just wanna end with one. Practice kindness. I know you think it comes natural, but it doesn't. You have to be intentional. Intentionally try to be kind to others at least two or three times a day. Go out of your way to be kind. And sometimes just smile. Don't you realize that a smile is not for you? You can't see it. A smile is for other people. Look for opportunities to show kindness. What kindness does is that it really feeds your brain the altruistic side of you so that you can feel good about yourself. It releases all of those things on the inside of you that you're like, wow, this feels good to help somebody across the street or to help a patient you know, get from point A to point B. Whatever it is, just look for opportunities to be kind to each other, be kind to your patients, but more importantly, be kind to yourself. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope that this has been beneficial to you. I want you to improve the wellness of not only your patients, by understanding them, understanding their triggers, understanding those signs and those quick ways of how we can support them. But I want you to look for opportunities to improve your own wellness as well. Remember, even the ocean has boundaries. So look for opportunities to fill your cup. Take care. Thank you so much for your time.